Welcome to Let's Talk Energy. Let's Talk Energy is a production of the National Energy Technology Laboratory. The Energy Lab is one of the U.S. Department of Energy's 17 national labs. Your host is Joe Culver. Thank you for joining us today for Let's Talk Energy. Our guest is Mr. Steve Bossert. Steve is the leader of a group at the Energy Lab that does analysis of electric power systems, including the smart grid. Now, Steve, I've been hearing discussion about this thing called the smart grid. Just what is that? Well, the smart grid is a vision of the future electricity grid in the United States. And we tend to think of the smart grid in terms of its functionality rather than a, a, a specific set of technologies because a specific set of technologies limits you in, in terms of what you can do with the smart grid. So we look in terms of seven basic functions that the NETL Modern Grid Strategy Team has facilitated getting a consensus among the power industry and the stakeholders of the power industry. And I'll go through the seven uh, characteristics for you, but the first one is that it enables uh, consumer participation in the grid so that the, the consumer can see in real time what they are, um, how much electricity they're using, what they're paying for it, they can participate in demand response kind of programs. Uh, the second characteristic of a functional characteristic of the smart grid is that it will accommodate all types of generation and storage options in a plug and play mode. The smart grid won't care where the electricity source comes from. So it can be either centralized generation like you typically have from coal and nuclear or distributed generation sources which many of the renewable sources are distributed generation. Uh, the third characteristic is it will enable new products, services, and, and markets. And what that means is that there can be a, a near real-time marketplace for buying and selling of, a, of electricity, as well as some new services that we haven't seen before, like uh, entities out there that will um, aggregate uh, units of electricity to, to, to buy and sell. Uh, next characteristic is it will provide the power quality needs of the digital economy and society that we have. Um, just uh, as recently as I think 2002, the uh, digital load in the United States was only 10 percent. Last year, uh, just past the 50 percent uh, margin, and it will keep going up from there, maybe achieving somewhere between 80 and, and 90 percent. Uh, next characteristics is it will optimize um, the assets that are already out there on the electric grid system and it will operate efficiently. The grid will also be able to anticipate and respond to disturbances. That's the immune system of the grid. We call that its self-healing properties. So we'll be able to see problems coming up, detect those problems, and correct them before we have outages. And the last functional characteristic of the grid is it will be able to operate resiliency to uh, attack and natural disasters, and this could include uh, uh, man-made cyber attacks, man-made physical attacks, and natural disasters like uh, you know, tornadoes, hurricanes, uh, etc. So we'll be able to recover from those events more quickly than in the past. We already have electricity coming into our homes, and I'm thinking that the electricity is going to be the same whether you have a smart grid or, or a dumb grid or, or whatever kind of grid. So why do we need this smart grid? One of the um, things that most people don't realize is, depending on what report you read, there's anywhere between uh, $80 billion and $150 billion of business losses per year when electricity isn't available, either through outages or lack of uh, power quality. When you compare that with the annual revenues from electricity sales of $330 billion per year, that's quite a significant num number, roughly one-third of, of the electricity revenues. Those business losses have to be passed on to the consumer in terms of increased prices for products and services. So it's sort of the hidden cost of uh, power outages, which is uh, fairly significant. But today, uh, if the power goes off, like back where I'm from, they had a big ice storm and they were without power. Generally, though, the utility companies are there and within an hour or a few hours, the electricity is back on. Why can't they just keep doing that? 
they could do that, but we, sh we won't realize the benefits that, that a smart brain uh, grid can bring uh, to American society. Uh, there was an EPRI 2004 report, for example, which showed that um, the return on investment for what a, cost, for what a smart grid will cost uh, versus what its benefits will be, you will reap a four to, four to one to five to one benefit uh, by investing in smart grid. Um, that's benefits to the utilities in terms of their operations, directly to consumers in terms of, of cost savings or cost avoidance, and then society, society at large. Um, so if we don't go to smart grid, we won't realize those benefits and we'll keep operating the way we do. We also have to recognize that we are now in a global uh, marketplace relative to, to our economy. And we're competing against nations that uh, have smart grid or installing smart grid and they will have a, uh, a global economic advantage over us if we don't keep in, in, uh, in par with them. It would seem to, to me from my perspective that there must be a lot of technology involved. Is there one set of technology that really defines smart grid? Um, no, there's not. Um, smart grid is not a one, one size fits all uh, for each of the, the uh, developers of smart grid, the investors in it. Um, it's going to involve looking at specific business cases for, for the investors, which will normally be utilities, as to what technologies they select for their smart grid and what degree to which they, they install their smart grid. The seven characteristics that I previously mentioned about smart grid, those represent a full functionality of smart grid, but it's not necessary that all utilities, all investors, fully realize all seven uh, characteristics of, of smart grid. It really depends on the specific business case. Something is, that sounds as, as exotic as the smart grid can't, in my mind, can't just happen without some kind of hitches. There must be some barriers to it. What are they? Yeah, there, there's several barriers, and we kind of group them into three areas. Uh, the first is change management, which I'll talk about that a little bit. Um, the second is uh, benefits directly to, to the utilities, and then the third is benefits uh, to uh, the larger society. So I'll talk a little bit about, about each of those a little bit. Uh, the change management one is really a notion of that we need a common vision uh, for the smart grid. We need to understand that there's a value proposition in terms of uh, recovering the investment of smart grid and actually realizing the, the benefits from it. There's a lot of need for uh, consumer education, uh, state regulatory and federal regulatory education. I'll talk a little bit about uh, more of that. And also there's some metrics needed in terms of uh, measuring progress towards achieving a smart grid so that we know you know, how f to what degree and how far are we to, to getting there. So um, you have to have an endpoint, so you have to have metrics uh, toward, towards achieving uh, that endpoint. Uh, there are also benefits to utilities, and they involve uh, improved metering and billing. There will be more accurate billing uh, to consumers, uh, less theft of electricity, uh, better outage management because they'll actually know where the outages are. Nowadays, the utilities typically wait till they get enough phone calls coming in in order to isolate where the outage is and then send out the trucks uh, to restore it. With smart grid, you know instantly where the outage is and, and, its, and its cause, and you can dispatch the trucks uh, immediately where you need to, to go. Uh, that will uh, also affect better workforce management uh, among, among the utilities. And also uh, better asset utilization, I think I mentioned uh, previously, where the utilities will be able to use more of the capacity of their generation assets, their transmission assets, and their distribution assets. For society benefits, one of the main benefits of society is we believe that electricity prices are, are going to increase, and, and we've seen that occur in, in many uh, states, either real or proposed uh, increases in electricity prices. Uh, we think smart grid will decrease the rate uh, that electricity prices uh, will rise. Uh, there will be improved reliability, which will lower those business losses uh, that I mentioned previously. Uh, there will be more grid robustness against possible uh, security-related uh, attacks. And also, anytime you have a smart grid, you have a great opportunity for economic development and, and new jobs growth. And uh, I think that's one of the keys, is that smart grid can provide uh, you know, the, the, econo the economic uh, 
availability of electricity and the reliability that businesses need uh, to, to, to operate. Uh, and lastly, and a lot of people don't think about this, but Smart Grid has a, a huge opportunity to transform the transportation sector through plug-in hybrid electric vehicles and electric vehicles. Um, Smart Grid uh, will be able to charge those cars and those cars will also be able to discharge onto the grid during uh, peak demand periods when the utility may need to call on the electricity stored in the batteries in those cars to help uh, meet peak demand uh, periods for electricity. Uh, so the smart grid has uh, huge opportunities to transform the transportation grid. We did an analysis which basically showed, and we did it when back when gasoline was $4 per gallon. Uh, we did a comparison that showed that electric vehicles had the potential to have the equivalent of a dollar uh, per gallon in terms of electricity prices. So electric vehicles could operate uh, quite a bit more cheaply on a per mile basis than our traditional uh, gasoline and diesel fuel vehicles. We've been hearing a lot of talk about what people are calling the stimulus package, the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act. Does this does that weigh in at all on smart grid? Yeah, actually there's uh, roughly 4.5 billion dollars in the uh, economic stimulus package uh, for smart grid and that involves some funds for uh, uh, large regional demonstration programs. It involves some matching grant programs where a company could choose to um, purchase smart grid technologies and share that cost with the government in a 50-50 ratio. It, to, to get this smart grid up where we really cover the United States, what are the estimates as far of how much it's going to cost? There was an EPRI 2004 study done, and what, what it showed was typically in a, in, a, in a year, there was $18 billion invested in transmission, distribution, maintenance, and expansion. If you add on top of that an additional $8 billion per year for 20 years, which is about $160 billion, uh, that will get you a smart grid. So over a 20-year period, roughly uh, $160 billion uh, for, to achieve smart grid in the United States. Now, bottom line, from, uh, from all of us like me who are consumers, uh, how much is my electricity going to have to go up to pay for all of that? That's a little hard to say. Um, you know, a lot of that has to do with uh, st what the state regulatory public utility commissions and public service commissions decides how they allow the utilities to recover their investment in smart grid as well as just their normal transmission and distribution, maintenance and expansion. Um, so I can't really give you an accurate fig figure on that. But you mentioned regulatory. So, so what will be the roles of the federal and the state governments in getting this smart grid underway? The state uh, public utility commissions and public service commissions play a large part in uh, the ability to accomplish smart grid in the United States because it really requires a uh, regulatory reform at the state level to allow the utilities to recover their investment in smart grid and to um, gain a profit from ac actually uh, implementing smart grid. And the traditional electric utility model was they get paid more for um, generating more electricity. The smart grid actually is trying to generate less electricity uh, through demand response program, through local consumer generation of electricity rather than utility generation. So the utilities and the regulators need to work out a deal on, on uh, how this new model is going to work. We talked about the roles of state and federal governments. The Energy Lab is a federal laboratory. Why are we leading the smart grid effort? Um, NETL for the past uh, four years or so uh, has been involved with uh, DOE's Office of Electricity Delivery and Energy Reliability and also the Office of Energy Efficiency and Renewable Energy. But for the Energy um, Office of Electricity Delivery and Energy Reliability, we've been uh, managing a lot of their solicitations and a lot of the projects that result from those solicitations. So these are grid R&D projects and some of them are smart grid projects where you integrate suites of technologies to comprise a smart grid and you demonstrate the, the benefits of those technologies. Does the concept of technology obsolescence enter into this? 
Yes, when um, utilities or other investors invest in the smart grid, um, they need to be very conscious and smart about uh, what technologies they invest in for you know the sensors, the controls, the um, generation options, the storage options, demand response kind of programs, the communication backbone of, of smart grid because I, what you don't want to do is through the, either the hardware or the software create a situation where you need to be continually changing that technology over time. Ideally you want to select technologies that are upgradable to the next version of that technology because as we know at least in the IT world um, you know the technology advances every few years so people are always constantly out there buying new computers with the latest software and that and uh, it's smart to invest in technologies that are upgradable to, to the next uh, advanced software versions. I think probably I'd like to wrap this up with, with a, a question from the consumer perspective. Let's say we have a smart grid and everything's working. Do, how does this affect my life? Do, do, do I have to do my laundry at a certain time of day? Does the, does the grid, is it smart enough to know to start the machine for me? Does it know when to start my coffee or, or do I still have to set stuff myself? There will be a home portal where um, the consumer has uh, electricity uh, choices in terms of uh, you know what price will they will they buy or not buy electricity what appliances will they allow to be turned on and off what generation or storage will they allow the utilities to control uh, so the consumer will need to need to set that up and the utilities will try to make those options as, as simple as possible so that you know people um, will have enough education uh, to be able to make intelligent choices there. And um, in turn for that, the um, consumer will gain a uh, pricing advantage by allowing the utility to either access their generation of storage or access their appliances to turn them on and off kind of thing. But of course, there will always be an override. So um, if a consumer on a particular day um, wants to run their appliances however they want to run them, they can override you know, whatever they have uh, agreed to with the utility on that particular day. We've been talking with Steve Bossert at the Energy Lab about the smart grid. Uh, it's something that I suspect it's going to play a big role in our future lives. Thank you for being with us, Steve. Oh, thank you, Joe.